wasn't sure if I should do this or not, but I have an opportunity to throw Ron right under the bus. And he's not here, um, so I thought I'd go for it. Um, one of the things you have to know in order for me to do this is that Ron and I share, is this on? Uh, Ron and I share some computer folders. That means that when he's working on his sermon, I can see what he's doing. I can't see what he's editing, but I can tell you that he is editing something and where he's working in, the, in that folder. He can also tell when I'm working on my sermon. And so last night after the service, I went home and Debbie and I were watching a really cool movie about the Brazilian soccer star Pele. And all of a sudden, somebody's editing my sermon for today. And I go, hey, what's up with that? So, hello, Ron, you know. Uh, and uh, this is me, what the heck? And he says, well, you know, he says, I'm sitting here in the airport in Alaska. I'm getting ready to take my, uh, move on my trip to Dominica. I had a few minutes, so I thought I'd check out your sermon. And uh, I noticed that there were some slides that could have been a little crisper. Maybe there were some fonts that were not exactly, you know, simpatico. So he starts where He says, I, really, I'm just trying to make you look smarter than you really are. <laughs> I said, oh, thanks, right? So before I go to bed, I've got to go through 60-something slides and make sure he hasn't changed any of the content or switch the orders around and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, uh, that is a, just a glimpse of ministry here at East Avenue Church. <laughs> all right, so see if you can see if there's an area in my slides where Ron might have edited something, right? So in this first slide that you see behind me, um, the top row is a group of great leaders from my century, the 20th century, right? You got Winston Churchill up there, you got Martin Luther King, and then you've got President uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy on the other side. Well, I was having a little bit harder time with great leaders of the 21st century, and granted, you know, we're just getting started, but it was a little bit harder, and it really boiled down to um, Ron or Prince, and so I, I went with Ron. I don't know if that was the right decision or not, but if you think it should have been Prince, just put that on your connection card, and uh, I'll try to edit that before it gets on our web page and stuff. So, if you've ever had the opportunity to work in management or sit in the boss's chair, one thing you know for sure about sitting in that chair, it's an absolute lightning rod for criticism and for sniping by all those people who would try to undermine your authority in order to climb the corporate ladder. But the self-serving individual never makes a good leader. Good leaders hold the good of the organization above the in, their own personal self-interest. Good leaders have a high degree of self-awareness. And according to Jim Collins, the author of the book Good to Great, are generally speaking more determined than they are clever. Now, this is a picture of Harry Truman. If you're under 30, he was a former president of the United States. And he once said that you can accomplish anything in life provided you don't mind who gets the credit. So our story today is about identity, it's about leadership, and it's about authority. Today's question is, whose son is the Messiah? So we're in the Gospel according to Luke, and we have been for a while. I love this book. Um, this is, we're going to be finishing chapter 20 today. It's a pivotal chapter in Luke's Gospel, and I think you'll find out why in just a few minutes here. But Luke is writing from the perspective of a non-Hebrew, and he writes to other outsiders just like himself, and because he does, we benefit from some historical context and um, history that we just wouldn't otherwise ha have. Now, Jesus' identity and his authority are challenged almost immediately in Luke's gospel. And you can't separate Jesus' identity from his authority because as the Son of God, he speaks on behalf of the Father. And right from the very beginning, uh, in Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, Satan's challenge to Jesus is, hey, if you really are the Son of God, Jesus' identity as beloved Son had just been affirmed at his baptism in the Jordan by his cousin John the Baptist, where we see the heavens open and the Spirit of God descend on Jesus in, for, in the form of a dove. And we hear the voice of the Father say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Later, on the Sabbath, while Jesus is teaching at one of the synagogues in Capernaum, Everybody's astonished at his teaching because it carries the weight of one who has its own authority. Well, maybe that was because God told Moses earlier, way back in the book of Deuteronomy, that he would raise up a prophet like Moses from among his brethren, that he would put his words in his mouth, and that he would speak to them all that he had commanded. But Jesus' challenges are met 
uh, and answered throughout Jesus' public ministry by his many signs and wonders. We see that Jesus says authority over the spirit realm, to heal the sick, and to raise the dead. So in the eyes of all who have been um, physical witnesses to these events, Jesus' authority as, as God's anointed is unquestioned. So the setup for our story today in chapter 20 begins with the first four verses, which goes like this. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came to him. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Well, Jesus replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Well, they discussed this amongst themselves, and then they, they decided that, hey, if we say from heaven, then Jesus will certainly ask us, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say human origin, all the people are going to freak out because they believe that John was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know where it's from. Jesus said, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. All right, let's back up the train. Just a slight hitch here. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was only a day or two earlier than this. And his, his entry into Jerusalem was a source of great consternation to the religious leaders at the time. And honestly, from their frame of reference, it seemed a little presumptuous. Jesus enters to the shouts of, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And all the people are shouting, you know, that this is God's chosen hero, the Messiah, the long-awaited king of Israel, right? So from the perspective of the religious ruling class, Jesus' entry and his claims looked and sounded a little bit arrogant, maybe even blasphemous. And Jesus' claims are not going to be taken at face value in Jerusalem and certainly not in the temple where this confrontation is taking place. Because Jesus enters as the expected king and not as a priest. And prophets, kings, and priests all functioned differently in Jewish culture. Kings don't offer sacrifices, and priests don't govern. So Jesus has no official role in the temple. Now the priests are given their authority based on their birthright into the tribe of Levi, who, was, um, who were descendants of Aaron, Moses' older brother. And the scribes, they were given their authority by virtue of their education. So who is this Jesus guy think he is anyway, right? Well, chapter 20 is all about Jesus' authority. And as we've already seen, Jesus has already reclaimed the temple as the legitimate center of instruction and righteousness so that all might be saved. And the uh, priests, chief priests, and the leadership, they're furious. Jesus is on their turf, and they demand again to know, by whose authority do you presume to speak? In their mind, and to their way of thinking, the law of God given to, given to Moses at Sinai rubber stamps their authority. And le but Jesus pushes back and says, and asks, what do you think? Was John's ministry from heaven, or is it from this earth? This is not a series of polite conversations. This is a series of confrontations that will ultimately get Jesus arrested, tried, and crucified. And this whole chapter is a struggle over who has the legitimate right to speak on behalf of God. So in this chapter, we get this wonderful parable about the master of the vineyard who sends his son uh, to collect his rightful due, only to have them murdered by the ten, uh, by the uh, Lee sees. Of course, the father in heaven is, is the master. The son in the parable represents Jesus. And these religi religious leaders are not, um, not confused about who the leaseholders are in Jesus' parable. And they're not really happy about that. Then we also get this parable about rendering taxes unto Caesar, which begs the question of who's really in charge, right? Caesar or Jesus? So the religious leaders who had made accommodations with Rome get all political with Jesus. But he answers that we are to render unto Caesar that which is inscribed with his image, and we're to render unto God that which was made in his. I love that, that picture, by the way. Finally, Jesus pivots, 
And up until this point, he's been a kind of on defense, but now he's gonna take an offensive position by asking a very pointed question about the Messiah, from uh, their understanding of the Messiah uh, from the Old Testament. And this is, brings us to our text today, beginning in verse 41. Then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? Wow, that's kind of an unexpected question because this challenges Jesus' own rightful claim. And David had many descendants, right? However, only one of them was claiming to be the son of God. So this is all about identity again. And Jesus continues, David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be a son? Now remember, Jesus' status as the son of David is kind of a big deal. I mean, it's presumed. And Jesus can indeed make this claim based on, uh, legally based on his, his stepfather, Joseph, and by birth through his mother, Mary. Um, but what Jesus, the question that Jesus is really asking here is, how is it that the older serves the younger? Fathers don't serve sons, do they? Well, much earlier, God had made a promise to David that his kingdom would endure forever. And speaking through the prophet Jeremiah and another, other places, we learn that David shall never want for a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. But Jesus isn't quoting Jeremiah. Jesus is quoting Psalm 110 here, which says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make an en your, your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your majesty, ma uh, mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. This is a psalm of David, and what's referred to as one of the royal or messianic psalms. And it depicts the Messiah as a victorious warrior who's going to bring peace. But this warrior king also comes after the order of Melchizedek, who is an Old Testament figure, both a king and priest of God Most High. All right, so way, way back, the first Hebrew was a guy named Abram, right? who God had called out of the land of Ur with his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot. And he'd made a promise to Abram that he would make him, his, his family, a great nation, and that he would give him a land in which they could flourish. And Abram's early adventures um, are full of adventure and misadventure. Ultimately, God and, Abram, um, God and Lot, I mean, Abram and Lot are forced to separate. God prospers them to the extent that the land will no longer support both of these families. And Lot, surveying the real estate in front of him, chooses the better portion of, of the land and settles near the town of Sodom. Well, sometime later, a war erupts up to the north around the area of Babylon between four kings. This war spreads southward. Eventually, Sodom is sacked. Lot and his family are taken captive. And when Abram hears about this, he comes to Lot's rescue. Melchizedek was the king of Salem in the book of Genesis who came to the aid of Abram while he was rescuing his nephew Lot. And he is also from a priesthood that predates Moses and Aaron. Melchizedek, we're told, is from a different order. What scripture is telling us is that this is an older claim to the priesthood than those who come through the line of Aaron. And this order that, that Melchizedek's part of, it allows for king and priest crossover. That's going to be important here in just a minute. Salem is the root form of the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So we are to understand that Melchizedek is the king of peace, who comes from Jerusalem, which means the city of peace. Now this is all kind of starting to sound a little bit familiar, right? In return for delivering Lot from his enemies, Moses honors this king by bringing him a tithe. But kings don't get tithes. Kings get spoils. Tithes are brought to the priests, right? So this is the type of king that's, that David says will sit at his Lord's right hand, one who will crush the kings of the day and rule in righteousness over the nations. Jesus is saying that as the Messiah, he and this king share a much older priestly claim. So if you guys want to talk about authority, we can do that. I'll see your authority, and I'll raise you mine, right? 
This is really kind of in your face. And um, Jesus isn't afraid to confront these self-serving and puffed up leaders. He's been pretty uh, measured in his response to all their questions, but he's about to take it to a whole new level. And little do they know at the time that they were in fact standing right in front of the legitimate great high priest. This should not have been big news for them. This had been foretold 400 years earlier by the prophet Malachi as God was condemning the priests for breaking his covenant because of their failure to address injustice and the evil deeds that was all around them. And speaking through Malachi, God says to the priests, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly, the Lord that you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire, he will come, says the Lord God Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will purify the Levites, that's the priests, and refine them like gold. What God is saying to these priests through Malachi is essentially that when the Messiah comes, his own son, he's going to sit on the throne and bring judgment. And with that judgment, he's going to restore order. And you know what? You guys are kind of in my way. And to rub salt, Jesus continues in verse 45. While all the people were listening, Jesus was saying to the disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at the banquets. But secretly, these guys devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Okay, it's getting kind of hot now, right? You cannot mock God's justice and act all self-righteous. That is not okay. And Jesus has just picked a fight with these same men just before the Passover and his trial, uh, his, his arrest and trial. Remember, Jesus has been telling us all along that he's going to a cross. And this kind of public humiliation here in the temple courts in front of all of these witnesses that have swelled Jerusalem just before the Passover, I'm sure, pretty sure that this is going to inspire the murderous rage that takes, him to get, takes, takes these leaders to get there. So, what does all this tell us about Jesus? So far in Luke's Gospel, we see that Jesus has fulfilled all three of his biblical roles. We see him as prophet, we see him as king, and now we see him as priest. And mind you, it's the priest's job to maintain the spiritual welfare of the people. It's their job to offer sacrifices to God on their behalf. Jesus will offer himself as a sac the sacrificial lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And I don't see anybody else stepping up to that plate. Jesus is nothing if he's not in intentional. Jesus is a strategic leader. His identity, his ministry, and his mission are affirmed at his baptism. His preparation, his commission, they're confirmed during his 40 days in the wilderness. The impl implementation of a strategic plan is rolled out with the call of the disciples. And Jesus' personal investment in his apostles over these past three or so years will ensure that they continue the work of reconciliation and regathering of a people for the Father after his demise. All of this positions Jesus right where he wants to be. If this was a football metaphor, I think we could safely say that he's at first and goal, right? And I think there's two specific takeaways from our passage today. I think we get a, an interesting glimpse into the character and the nature of Jesus' leadership style. The origin of his authority and the cost that's associated with that authority. In today's leadership vernacular, Jesus' style would be referred to as the Stockdale Paradox, which is named after Vice Admiral James Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war and a survivor of the war in Vietnam. It's, a, uh, it's an amazing story that you should totally check out sometime later. Anyway, because of his leadership and his tenacity, someone decided to name a le leadership style after him, which says that you must maintain unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. 
and at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever those might be. And we most definitely see that in the life of Christ, whose unwavering faith and ability to confront the brutal facts that he will endure come from knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt that he is, in fact, the son of David. He is the Messiah. He is God the Son. So, any way you look at this, Jesus' life and his actions satisfy our identity and authority questions. Second, we see the right and proper use of authority. In Trinity, the Father and the Son have the power to take the, simply take the kingdom by force. But together and in unity, they opt out of that option and in preference for love. Because in God's economy, love trumps power. And that's kind of a big deal. So today, if you call yourself a Christ follower, this is where I would say insert application here. And I want you to know, I totally stole this from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the, in the, his letter to the Philippians, which says that we are to have this mindset that was also found in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted, really a better word is vindicated, vindicated him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when it comes to God-ordained leadership, there's no comparison between Jesus and his rivals in this passage. Unlike Jesus, these men are self-elevating and self-serving. Now, Jim Collins, the author of the book I referred to earlier, describes what he calls level five leadership this way. He says, compared to high-profile leaders with big personalities who make headlines and become celebrities, great leaders seem to come out of nowhere. They're self-effacing, quiet, reserved, sometimes even shy. These leaders are a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. And I think it's safe that we can say Jesus pretty much fits this description, right? I mean, there's times when he gets his back up, but Jesus is absolutely uncompromising when it comes to fulfilling his commission to redeem and to reconcile humanity. But unlike Harry Truman, and because of the great cost, our God not only wants and deserves the credit, but he demands it. Jesus' self-sacrificial and obedient love, combined with his leadership, stand in sharp contrast to the religious leaders in our passage today. The Father sent the Son into the world because he knew we needed a Savior. He knew there was no way that we could get there on our own. And the offering of a Son, God's own Son, that was the ultimate price of our salvation. It was the ransom for our soul. It was a debt that we can never repay. And this is what makes worship really meaningful, right? Because unlike any other great leader, Jesus is worthy of our worship because he is in fact the Messiah and God the Son. So the question for you and I this morning is, what do you do with that? I mean, you can choose to surrender and accept God's gracious gift, salvation by grace through faith, or you can continue to live like there's no God in the universe. God could have taken the kingdom by force, but he instead allowed us the freedom to be able to respond to him in love. And that's pretty awesome. The author of the book of Hebrews puts it this way. He says, therefore, since we have such a great high priest, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. So how about it? Where are you today? Have you surrendered? Are you willing to surrender today to accept God's offer of love and salvation? It's a question that you should ask yourself. If that's you today, this is a great day to do that. And I'm going to say a prayer here in just a moment 
that if you say in your heart, you can become part of God's kingdom right here and today. Would all of you guys bow your heads and close your eyes? Just kind of make an altar where you're at. And if that was you today, say these words along with me as I say them out loud. Father, I am so grateful that for your love and salvation that you would send your own son to die the death that I deserved. Lord, I acknowledge that I cannot save myself. Jesus, would you save me? Would you meet me in my place of need this morning? Would you show me how to walk in your ways so that I might please you in, in all I do? I surrender my life to you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.